good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Otis. I'm one of the pastors here. It's so good to be with you this morning. I'm so glad that you came out because if I had a choice, I might have stayed at home today knowing what's coming. Um, as Pastor Rick said, this is Palm Sunday. It's one of the beginnings of Holy Week. It is the end of Lent. We are so excited about what we're going to learn about today. I'm really excited about what we're going to focus on today. It's part of my life growing up and part of my life in school and part of my life after school. We're going to talk about this today. This is not a palm tree. It's Minnesota. I have to check. We're going to focus on a fig tree today, and, and we're going we're gonna to focus on that because there is a story that happens after the triumphal entry, after Jesus comes in, that I think is important for us to think about as we move through Holy Week. But, but if you have your Bibles or your phones, will you turn with me to Mark chapter 11? If you don't have a Bible with you, you can use the Bible on the back of the chair in front of you. And as we said, it's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the day that we celebrate Jesus waking up on this Sunday morning and deciding to ride into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey unannounced. The crowd had no Facebook announcements. They had no news broadcast. They had none of those things to get them ready for Jesus entering into the city. What had happened was people heard from word of mouth that their king that they had been waiting on all of these years had arrived and they filled the streets and there were cries of Hosanna, Hosanna, and people did this for a long time. It was a long celebration of Jesus entering into the city and entering into their life as their king, and it's such a significant moment in the life of the church and who we are, but today we're going to move past that. Today we're going we're gonna to pay attention to this particular plant. And I need, to I need you to understand a little bit about me in order to understand why and how we got to this moment. Last year, I got to preach Palm Sunday, and, and it was such a good, good time to study about this place, to study about what happened in this moment in the life of God's kingdom. And then I came to this moment where Jesus tells this story about a fig, and Matthew and Mark tell this story, and I got stuck. Because, because plants for me are a big deal. I, I might call myself a bit of a plant enthusiast. I love them. I studied them in school, as I said. And, and like, to, to further illustrate this point, I want you to understand just how much of a big deal this is to me. When we're in Ghana, at the end of our trip, we go on a safari in a national park where there are elephants that can only be seen in this one park, in this one place in the entire world. And people are looking to take this kind of picture when they're in the park. They all want to see the elephants, but this is what I'm taking pictures of. <laughs> I kid you not, I might have hundreds of images of trees sitting in the middle of nothing, looking beautiful from a distance, or flowers that look like this. Because it's who I am. It's, it's also because flowers and trees are complex. They are beautifully made by God. They have such a special meaning in our lives. And this particular tree, this, this fig tree, is found all over the place in what we're going to study today. And it's important in the lesson that Jesus is teaching us today. And I can't, I can't wait to share that with you. But, but I have another thing that I would love to have happen out of today. I would love for my love for trees and my love for plants to rub off on you and so that you become a little more curious about how they play into the life of Israel and into the life of us and the stories of the Bible and the things that we're going to have unfolded to us in the rest of the week on Good Friday and Easter Sunday morning. I hope that today you will understand some of what Dr. Garland, who is a seminary professor for me at Truett Seminary at Baylor and an author says to us about trees. He says, trees are frequently used as symbols and are portrayed as sensitive to their moral surroundings. He taught us this in school so that we would understand when we read poetry and literature of Sylvia Plath or Wendell Berry, that we would understand their feelings and attachments to plants and nature and trees goes deep. It's deep inside of us because God has made it that way. Today, we will see Jesus use this fig tree to teach us something that we already know. Let me illustrate how we already know it. How many of you have ever felt like you were caught in a loop? There might be a loop 
of addiction. It might be a loop of decision making. It might be loops in relationships that you just couldn't figure out how to get out of. We all have that experience, right? We all know what it's like to be stuck in this place and and do the same things over and over again. But what we're going to learn about today is that Israel had that same problem as they were going through their life and and how, how Jesus helps them get out of it. And believe it or not, this is what's going to help us have a framework for how to do that. So we're going to pick up today not at the entrance of Jesus. We're going to pick up on the next morning. It's not Palm Sunday morning that we're going to look at, but two days, the next two days in Jesus's life. You see, the next morning after he entered in, after, after he missed church service that evening, Jesus wakes up early with his disciples and they walk in heading back to the temple because they they want to see what's going on. And Jesus looks way out in the distance and he sees a fig tree. And then he goes up to this fig tree. And I bet some of you now are beginning to remember this story. It's a really odd story. It's a really small story in the the breadth of the drama of Holy Week. This, This little incident that only Matthew and Mark tells us sits in the middle of this, but it's highly important for us. And I bet if you're remembering the story and what comes after this story, you're kind of wondering, is this what I want to bring my friends and family to this morning? This isn't the Jesus that we all think about. This isn't the loving Jesus in in our minds about it. But Jesus is really sort of teaching us something today. And it would be really easy for us to go from the triumphal entry of Jesus and skip all the way to the Last Supper or Good Friday or Easter Sunday morning, but today, today we need to stay in this point because it sets the stage for all of the things that are gonna happen for the rest of the week. And so today, we're gonna start here. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry, seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf. He went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Now let me explain to you what happens next, because it's probably the more common of the stories that we're going to talk about today. From this moment when Jesus seems to be hangry and upset about a tree that didn't have food for him to eat, he marches into the temple. He goes to the heart of where Israel believes God is. He goes to to this place called the Court of Gentiles where where people who aren't Jews would come and learn about Jesus and be taught about Jesus and give their life to God. And they wanted the people who already knew about God and followed God to be the people who taught them that. But when, when he showed up, he saw something very, very different. And I think we often read this part of the New Testament without an image of what the temple actually looks like. So before we move forward, I want to show you what the court of Gentiles looks like and give you a scale of the size of the court of Gentiles and the size of the temple as it was represented in Jesus's day. You see, so Jesus is walking into this space expecting to see people who are outside of the the original covenant with him learning about God and giving their life to God. And what he saw was something completely different. What he saw was this space being full of tables with people selling doves for sacrifices and money changers exchanging money for the, the things that they needed to buy to take their next step in holiness or ritualism towards God. What they saw were people traveling from one side of the temple to the other as a shortcut to get home with their groceries from the market. And Jesus seems to lose it. He begins flipping over tables and running out the buyers and the sellers and And he runs them all out, and then he does this really strange thing for somebody who we think is hangry about not having breakfast that morning. He begins to teach. He begins to give them the example of what it's like to be with God. He teaches them and reminds them of things that happened in the past. He teaches them from from Jeremiah that that this place, this, this house, was supposed to be a house of prayer. It's supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. 
Everyone was supposed to be able to come to this place and find their relationship with God. But what has happened in this place is something completely different. It's been turned into a den of robbers. And then celebration broke out, right? People were happy, right? Well, the people who were there, the Gentiles who were there, and the, probably some of the Jewish people who were there, they were amazed by his teaching. But the high priests and the teachers of the law, this is when they decided that they needed to kill him. But that didn't deter Jesus. He and the disciples stayed here teaching and loving and caring on people until evening, and then they left. And then they got up the next morning to do it again. In the next morning, they, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the root. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you curse has withered. And when we read this, we still have to sit in this place that it doesn't fit the image that we want to have of Jesus. Something has happened in this moment that, that is so out of character for us because In our heads, don't we think things like, wouldn't it have been easier for Jesus just to make the tree have figs on it than to curse it and kill it? Isn't this the Jesus that turned water into wine? Isn't this the Jesus that multiplied the fish and the loaves? He could have just made the tree produce fruit in this moment. And I think as we go back to Dr. Garland, he he says some things that helps us sort of frame what's going on in our minds in this moment. He says this, Jesus' demonstration of outrage in the temple and at the fruitless tree is unexpected and puzzling. Why this sudden violent outburst? Why this withering curse on on what seems to be an innocent fig tree that fails to satisfy his hunger? Why does he vent such anger on an inanimate object that fails to produce fruit out of season? Aren't these the questions that are rolling around in your mind? Isn't this story a little bit strange, especially where it's sitting in the life of Jesus? This is Holy Week. We should be celebrating Jesus walking into our lives and going to be our king and looking forward to Easter Sunday morning. But it feels a little bit out of place. And the way Mark tells it, doesn't it feel like it's a little bit disconnected? I mean, he begins this story and it's like he forgets where he is and he begins to tell you a story about what happens next and then comes back and sort of resolves the issue of the fig tree. But it's not a mistake. Mark is doing something. Mark is helping you understand what it took him time to understand. He's connecting these two stories because they are intimately woven together. And he's using a literary technique called an inclusio to do so. This is a technique where similar information starts at the beginning and the end. And in the middle, there's something that's important and is connected to that. This is a technique that's used by biblical writers over and over again. And what he's actually doing for us this morning is creating a fig tree sandwich. It's sort of like a fig Newton. He's putting the fig tree in the beginning, and then he's going to the temple, and he resolves the story of the fig after he tells you this because they are connected. You cannot study one without studying the other. But I think there's some things that are missing for us that we need to understand. I think there are some cultural and agricultural things that we don't understand about the importance of this tree to the people in Jesus' time that would help us understand what Mark is actually trying to teach us. And I just want to tell you, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to spill some tree facts on you. But they're important. And I hope what they'll do is take my love for this particular tree and pour it out on you. I want you to understand how important this tree is to Israel and to us. Would you be surprised if I told you that there are over 900 types of fig tree in the world? They grow all over the world, even in Minnesota, as long as you put them in a pot. They are prolific in what they do. They come in all shapes and sizes, from vines to shrubs to trees. They grow from five feet to 20 feet tall. 
They have an amazing root structure that's different than most trees on the planet. Most trees' roots either grow wide or grow deep. These trees can do either depending on their environment. It's why they can grow anywhere and all over Israel. It's why you see them in the hills and in the valleys when you see them in the dry places. The image of this fig tree is the image of what God wants us to be as the church. This tree survives everywhere. Did you know that the fruit of this tree is the oldest fruit known to man? It is talked about from every group around the world. Did you know that this is one of only a few, a handful of trees that can do this amazing thing where they leaf, produce fruit, and flower all at the same time? That's important because one of the other things that we don't understand about this fruit is that when it begins to leave, this fruit produces what's, what we would call a pre-fruit. And it's not as sweet as a fig. It's actually an acquired taste. But the moment that the tree produces leaves, this fruit begins to appear. So when Jesus walks up to the fruit out of season, out of season for the ripe figs, He should still expect that this tree would have fruit on it. It gives clarity to what's happening to understand the miracle that God has woven into this tree. But it doesn't stop there. Would you be surprised if I told you that the fig is prominent, figs are prominent in every major religion on the planet? Christianity, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and Hinduism all represent of representations of this fruit and this tree woven into their thought process. Figs, fig trees represent wisdom, security, provision, blessing, and judgment in all of those spaces. And for us, for us, so we understand just how important this tree is to Israel and to us. This fig tree or its fruit is mentioned 72 times in 66 Bible verses from Genesis to Revelation. It, is an, it plays an immense role in who Israel thinks it is and how other people see it. All of that starts all the way in Genesis. I jumped ahead. I was going to give you a quiz, but now I won't. It jumps ahead all the way into Genesis where there are only three trees that are named in all of Genesis. And this is one of them. There's the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the fig tree are the only trees given by name in Genesis. They're so important because if you remember after the fall, what did Adam and Eve sew their clothes out of? Fig leaves. The Bible says this, then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is where the relationship between figs and the kingdom began. What were they covering? I know there's an obvious thought in your mind about what they were covering, but they weren't covering up the obvious thing. It wasn't about covering up their bodies. They were covering up a change that only God would notice in them. We need to understand that what they were doing, it wasn't about their bodies, it was about their shame. And what were they ashamed of? They were covering up their decision to choose their wisdom over God's wisdom. And as we will see, Israel has the same issue of choosing their wisdom over God's wisdom. But we understand this, right? When you're standing on a stage or standing in your house or standing with your friends or your family and all of your truths are laid bare, what's your first impulse? It's to cover it up, right? It's to save face, right? It's to make yourself look appealing and clean and pure so that people don't begin to question the things that we hide behind and we think people can't see. And that decision plays out over and over and over again in Israel's life. It's reflected in all of the verses that you would see from Genesis to Revelation. All of those references point to this choice of choosing our wisdom over God's wisdom. But when you read those texts, there's a phrase that shows up over and over again. And it's this phrase. Under their own vine and under their own fig tree. 
And as we go through the next few verses so that you can see how this cycle that continues in Israel life continues to perpetuate over and over again, God's will and others' will, I want you to look for this phrase and think about what it means for Israel and what it might mean for us. We'll start in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25, and it says, During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Bathsheba, lived, from, no, sorry, during Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Bathsheba, lived in safety, everyone under their own fig tree and under their, under their own vine and under their own fig tree. This is an example of living under God's wisdom. What did Solomon ask for? Wisdom. Was it his wisdom? You wanted God's wisdom. And when you live under God's wisdom, you live in peace. You live in prosperity. But then Israel in 2 Kings gets to experience the outside world coming in and using those same words to pull them away from God. The king of Assyria says, make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat from your own vine and your own fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take you to a land like your own. Can you feel the pull? Can you feel how the cycle is perpetuating? This goes on. Jeremiah seeming to give us a vision of what Jesus is going to do in these two days after after his entry into Jerusalem. He says this, I will take away their harvest, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the vine. There will be no figs on the fig tree and their leaves will all wither. What I have given them will be taken away. And then Micah. Micah says, everyone will sit under their own vine, under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. He's telling them when you live with God in peace, you find this thing in overabundance. You get to sit with God. But three chapters later, Micah turns on Israel and he says to them, you are like a fig tree where I cannot find early figs because you are people who are faithless. The cycle continues over and over again. It is this perpetual cycle that does damage to them as a people and does damage or hurts the kingdom. It doesn't seem to stop. And this this phrase is at the center of it. Because if it's taken the wrong way, if we take it as this is mine, it's what I control. I get to decide how my resources are used. I get to decide who gets to sit underneath my tree. I get to decide what is about me that people get to see. I get to, I get to, I get to. But thank goodness God is faithful and consistent because he consistently reminded them as he consistently reminds us that their connection to him is what will give them the actual peace and abundance that they want. He moves them from Genesis all the way to Zechariah chapter 3, verse 10, when he says this, In that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under your own vine and under your own fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. That day, that day that he's talking about, that day is coming on Sunday. What we celebrate on Sunday is the day that he's talking about. He's talking about the day when he will clean sins away. On that day, this is what I want my people to do, to not think about their own fig tree, but to think about sitting with others in the knowledge of who I am. You see, God wanted them to be an example, not the exception to what was happening in the life of the people who were around them. And I want to tell you that I don't want to sit underneath my fig tree alone. I don't want to make this about me. I want God to be the source of my safety and my security and my peace. And I want to share that with everyone. I want peace and abundance. Isn't that what we all want? Isn't that what we all strive for? Isn't that the purpose of the things that you buy and the the things that you get to give you comfort? Isn't it to find peace everlasting? And that's what, that's what excites me so much when you read this text, when you think about what God is doing with these trees in this week that we're going to unfold, that, that this fig tree, it fits so seamlessly, so intricately into our life with God. 
It's such a visual representation of what God is doing in our lives, what God is calling us to do in other people's lives, and how we should trust in him. Adam and Eve turned to it when they needed something to cover up their shame and their insecurities. Israel turned to it for daily provision. They ate it. They used it as medicine. They used it to cover themselves up in the heat of the day. But in reality, for them, it was a symbol of peace and prosperity. It was the symbol of life that other people saw about them. It was so woven deeply into them that people who didn't even follow God would use the term to try to pull them away. And so just imagine now what it's like when Jesus turns and walks up to this big, beautiful fig tree and pronounces a curse on it. What's going through their minds And then he walks into the temple, which is supposed to be the place for all nations to come and have peace and relationship with God, just like Adam and Eve had in the garden before the fall. And Jesus declares it all counterfeit. Jesus sees all the practices that are being put in place inside the temple, and they are practices that are for the insider. They are, they are the insiders that God had such a vision for. He didn't have a vision for them to hide within the temple walls. What he wanted them to do was to be missionaries to all nations, to go out and share what it was like to have provision given to you by God. But instead, he found a safe place to make things that made us comfortable. And we kept the people out who God wanted to let in. And the disciples, they see all of this. And the next morning, they walk back into the town to go into the Seneca or to go to the temple again. And Peter notices the fig tree has withered, withered from the root. It looked like this. And I wonder in that moment if he began to put everything together. I wonder if this is the moment when Matthew and Mark started to think about what it is that God was trying to teach them in this moment. I wonder if they wanted to turn to him and ask him, wait, are we the fig tree? Are are we the counterfeit version of what's supposed to be happening? I mean, for years, we have presented ourselves the way you wanted us to as the source of abundance and peace. We invite people into this version of what it is that you've called us to do. We built the temple, but, but are we really making room for the people who you want, God? Can you imagine how that must have felt for them? if this is the process that was going through their mind. And to be clear, because I think, I think if we were there, I think if us on the other side of this were there and we were talking to Peter, what we would clearly tell him is this. We would say, Jesus is saying to us, Peter, that all the things that we have been doing that point to us, all the things that we have created that make it about us and for us, all the ways that we make it easy for us in the purchasing of sacrifices and the shortcuts to and from our homes through what God, where God is supposed to live in our lives, all of those things are wrong. Because what we're supposed to be doing is pointing God's people and the people who don't know him to the peace and the peace and abundance that God provides. And so I know it's Palm Sunday, and I know oftentimes we read this verse and we pass it on by as if it's some weird, quirky thing that happens, and it's not, but this is not a throwaway moment. This is not an oops moment where God leaks out or Jesus leaks out his power or that he's hangry or that he's upset. Jesus is teaching us something. He's playing out a parable right in front of our eyes. And more than that, it's so much deeper than that. What he's doing in this moment is he's setting himself up to be the answer to the problem, the answer that will help us break out of this perpetual cycle of choosing our will over his will. He's setting the stage for what's going to happen the rest of the week. It's amazing that he enters into our life and we rejoice in that. God wants us to know that there is a problem, and this is the problem, and there is an answer, and he's the answer. And I can't help but wish and pray and hope that if, if, if Peter could have only had this view, the view that we have on this side of Jesus resurrecting, if he knew that, if he knew that Jesus was saying that he was the answer to all of these problems, 
that Jesus was, was against all of these counterfeit things, the counterfeit religion and business and relationships that stand in the way of us truly being free in Jesus. I wish that Peter could have had this view. I wish that they all could have had this view. If Peter could have only seen and known at this moment how committed Jesus was, maybe it would have changed what happened to Peter a few days later. If Peter only knew that Jesus was planning to replace the false Eden with himself, oh, what a difference it would have made. It would have made a difference in the way that they walked into Jerusalem the rest of the week. It would have made a difference in the way that they reacted to what happened to Jesus on the cross. It would have made a difference in their lives. They didn't have that view, but we do. Because we know that with all of this knowledge, with all of their understanding that we didn't have until today about the importance of this tree and all the visual images of what happened along these two days with the tree not producing fruit and the tree being withered and Jesus in the temple, he still won't fully understand it until Jesus is gone. They won't get it until Jesus is gone and died on the cross and resurrected on Easter Sunday morning. They still don't understand that they're still playing out that same cycle over and over in their lives, trying to choose their will over Jesus' will, over God's will, over, over what it was, what perfection is supposed to be as it was represented in the garden. But Jesus is telling them in this moment, stop thinking about your own vine and your own tree and abide in me. I am the true vine. We won't hear that until later from Jesus. But Jesus is telling them that he is the answer. But you know what? Jesus knew that Peter and the guys, he knew they weren't going to get it in this moment. He, knew, he knows that it's hard for us to get it even today. And so instead of explaining this parable to them, Jesus turns and gives Peter a statement of simple declaration of truth. He says this, have faith in God. Because we know at some point the temptation, Peter, the temptation, disciples, the temptation to us who are here in this room and to us that are at home, that temptation is going to come and ask us to turn back away from the decision to make God the author of the peace in our life. For Peter, it came a few days later when he denied Jesus three times. But what about us? I can think about all the ways that I make my agenda more important than Jesus' agenda. I bet you can too. I bet you can think of all the ways that we as a church, we as a global church might slip back into these false counterfeit agendas to make it easy for us to worship God and be with God while restricting who else can enter in with us. I understand it because it's so easy to want to sit under my own fig tree and for the kingdom to look like my perfect version of it for me and for the people who I want to sit with. But that idea in my head, that idea in my head is the exact example of the counterfeit that the world wants us to believe. Today, we are reminded that if we do that, it will end up fruitless and withered and dead. And we don't want our lives or our church to be fruitless. We want our lives and this church to be a victory for Jesus, for people to come and know him. So let's be people who don't choose our own way but choose to abide in Jesus, who delight in Jesus, who, pre, who help other people delight in Jesus. It's why Pastor Rick and the staff, we teach gospel fluency to you in every aspect of life in this church because it's so important for us to understand how the gospel should play out in our lives. This is why we partner with people like Next Chapter, whose mission is to build lasting relationships with people who are impacted by a cycle of incarceration. Their whole goal is to restore them to God and to family. It's why we have Celebrate Recovery on campus, because we know that people have hurts and habits and hangups, and they, they're this continuous cycle of hurting them and hurting the relationships that they have with others, and they need someone to help them break it. Because it's so easy just to fall back into the trap. It's so easy to give in to the need and the desire to have our own way. Let's not do that. Let's be the example. Let's do what Jesus told us to do today and have faith in God and to pray. 
And so what I hope happened today is that a little bit of my love and my appreciation about how God has sown these trees into our life as physical reminders of what it is that he teaches us in his word. I hope that that's happened for you today and that you will come back on Good Friday and you'll come back on Easter Sunday morning to see how we unfold the next trees into the meaning of our relationship with God. But today I want to close. I want to close with a prayer from Martin Luther King Jr. And I'm not going to put it on the screen. I just want us to think about the days that are coming ahead and what it is that God is calling us to do. I want us to pray together as we hear the words of Martin Luther King Jr. Would you pray with me? Thou eternal God, out of whose absolute power and infinite intelligence the whole universe has come into being, we humbly confess that we have not loved thee with our hearts, souls, and minds, and we have not loved our neighbor as Christ loved us. We have all too often lived by our own selfish impulses rather than by the life of sacrificial love as revealed by Christ. We often give in order to receive. We love our friends and hate our neighbors. We go the first mile but dare not go the second. We forgive and dare not forget. And so as we look within ourselves, we are confronted with the appalling fact that the history of our lives is the history of an eternal revolt against you. But thou, O God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us for what we could have been but failed to be. Give us the intelligence to know your will. Give us the courage to do your will. Give us the devotion to love your will. In the name and in the spirit of Jesus, amen.